So uh, welcome to the Pluriversal Design Book Club. Um, we have many co-hosts. Um, so I am one of your co-hosts. I'm Leslie Ann Noel. I'm co-chair of the Pluriversal, um, what is our name? Pluriversal Design uh, Special Interest Group of the Design Research Society. And then I'm now already going to pass you over to, who shall I pass it over? To um, Renata as one of our co-hosts and then Renata, you'll pass it to our other two co-hosts. Now we have a bigger team managing this year. So, okay, Renata. I think, uh, hello, everybody. I'm Renata Leitão. I'm one of the, the co-chairs of the Pluriversal Design Special Interest Group. And, and Mariana, would you like to introduce yourself? I'm Mariana Braga. I am a designer and research associate in Imagination Lancaster. Actually, I am a Brazilian. And I have been very interested in the colonial studies because uh, I have been investigating how design or undesign can contribute to equity. So the book club I am co-host now, and it is a great opportunity for me to learn more and also to open my mind and to better understand the implications for design as well for us as designers. So I think I am more a learner rather than contributing a lot, but uh, yeah, it's a pleasure to be here with you all today. Thank you, Leslie, Renata and Jananda for ha having me as well. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Mariana. Thank you. So I think I, I'm going to start to present uh, and share my screen. So uh, I'm going to present uh, just one chapter um, of Stuart Hall. And I think he, one of the goals here in the book club is that we present um, texts, books, articles, papers that inspired us. And I have to say that Stuart Hall was very important in my life. And Leslie and I talked a lot because he was a Jamaican British. He was born in Jamaica and he studied and spent most of his life in England. And he has this thing of, of being an outsider or being someone that was born in the global south and uh, brought this migrant diasporic perspective to the country in which he worked. So he used to say that Britain is my home, but I'm not English. He was a little, a kind of a familiar stranger. And I totally identify with this, 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 uh, this perspective of being an outsider in North America. So he was a pioneer of cultural studies. So he would study mass culture, popular culture. And that's something that was very innovative at that time because studying popular culture wasn't something that was really considered as, uh, as important. People would study high, high culture. But he says that if you wanted to understand a society, you cannot only read uh, uh, just uh, journals and papers, high culture. You have to read popular culture. He was also um, nicknamed, uh, nicknamed as the godfather of multiculturalism. So uh, here, he didn't write books. You don't have one book, a big book written by Stuart Hall. He wrote papers, essays, chapter, edited books. So we are going to, ha to have some collections like the essay essay essays. And this is very interesting because you have here two of the main phases of his work. The, the, the first volume is about foundations of cultural studies. When he helped to create the Center for Contemporary Cultural Studies in Birmingham. So if you want to present something about cultural studies, if you have been inspired by Stuart Hall, really I invite you to present about this 
first phase of his work. Then his, the second phase is when he moved to the Open University because he wanted to, to reach more people. And he started to write about questions of race, ethnicity, identity, and diaspora, to write about imperialism and colonialism. And what's really interesting that I love, that I totally love to, 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 to go back to his book, is how easy to understand, how accessible is his language. I'm super used to Latin American decolonial thought, Mignolo and Escobar and, and all the, the, those people. And sometimes I think um, I, it's very interesting, but you use terms that are a little bit more difficult. But Stuart Hall, no, it's clear, it's easy to understand. So if you want to, to really, um, sometimes brings uh, some, some explanations to your work, I really, really recommend you to, to go to, to, to this book because it's very easy to understand, very accessible. So, uh, he writes a, a lot about identity. And you're going, to, to, uh, you're going to, to, to see a lot about identity. And for him, identity is constructed in discourse. It's not something that was given sociological or, or biologically. It's not an essence that pre-exists representation. So identity is constructed in the representation. And it's best understood as constructed in and through a dialogical process. It's not about the self-creation, but it's about this relationship between me and not me and the others. The identity that, that the others try to ascribe you and the, the, the identity that you assert. That is the, the dialogue, the, the conversation. In this conversation, you construct a discourse and you construct your, your identity. I chose to, to present this chapter, The West and the Rest, the Discourse and Power. And it was first published in, in, a, in a textbook for the Open University. The, the name is The Formations of Modernity, Understanding Modern Society, the introduction book. So he was in pedagogic mode. He was trying to really understand step by step how this discourse was formed. He, another thing is that he is um, associated with Marxist theory, new left and Marxism, but he argues that the traditional Marxist theory, theory neglects imperialism and colonialism. And he really believes that you cannot explain capitalism, how it was formed, if you only deal with inter internal dynamics. You have to address imperialism, you have to, to address the, the European expansion. So the, the West and the rest, this course and power. So it's a chapter about how relations between Western and non-Western societies came to be represented. So the formation of the discourse of the rest, the, the West and the rest. And now I really wanted to we go to, to our, our read along. So each one, if each one of you can read one paragraph, because I imagine that most of you uh, didn't read the book. So it's a chance to read together. So who would like to, 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 to start? I'll go. Excuse mm -hmm. me. Um, where and what is the West? This question puzzled Christopher Columbus and remains puzzling today. Nowadays, many societies aspire to become Western, at least in terms of achieving Western thoughts of living. But in Christopher Columbus' day, the end of the 15th century, going West was important mainly because it was believed to be the quickest route to the fabulous wealth of the East. Indeed, even though it should have become clear to Columbus that the new world he had found was not the East, he never ceased to believe that it was, and even spiced his reports with outlandish claims. Our ideas of East and West have never been free of myth and fantasy, and even to this day, they are not primarily ideas about place and geography. 
And you mm -hmm. can even we'll have this thing that the, the, the global north and global south are not uh, geographic uh, uh, positions. Oh. Next. The central, central concern of this chapter is to analyze the formation of a particular pattern of thought and language, a system of representation, which has the concepts of the West and the rest at its center. The West, the West is a historical, not a geographical construct. By Western, we mean the type of society that is developed, industrialized, urbanized, capitalist, secular, and modern. Such societies arose at a particular historical period, roughly during the 16th century after the Middle Ages and the breakup of feudalism. Nowadays, any society, wherever it exists on a geographical map, which shares these characteristics can be said to belong to the West. The concept or idea of the West can be seen to function in the following ways. First of all, it allows us to characterize and classify societies into different categories, i.e. Western, non-Western. It is a tool to think with. It sets a certain structure of thought and knowledge in motion. Secondly, it, Secondly, is, an it is an image or set of images. It condenses a number of different characteristics into one picture. Thirdly, it provides a standard or model of comparison. It allows us to compare to what extent different societies resemble or differ from one another. Fourthly, it provides criteria of evaluation against which other societies are ranked and around which powerful positive and negative feelings cluster. For example, the West equals develop equals good equals desirable, or the non-West equals underdeveloped equals bad equals undesirable. The emergence of an idea of the West was central to the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment was a very European affair. However, in this chapter, we argue that the rise of the West is also a global story. The so-called uniqueness of the West was, in part, produced by Europe's contact and self-comparison with other non-Western societies, the rest. Ferdinand de Saussure argued that the words night and day on their own can't mean anything. It is the difference between night and day which enables these words to carry meaning, to signify. In reality, Differences often shade imperceptibility into each other. When exactly does night become day? Such binary oppositions seem to be fundamental to all linguistics and symbolic systems and to the production of meaning itself. This chapter then is about the role which the rest play in the formation of the idea of the West and Western sense of identity. At a certain moment, the fates of which had been for many centuries separate and distinct worlds become, some would say, fatally um, harnessed together in the same historical time frame, they became related elements in the same discourse or way of speaking. They became different parts in one global social, economical, and cultural system, one independent world, one language. So he explains that uh, basically, we can, can we can see the onset of the expansion with two events: the early Portuguese explorations of the African coast. It's also it was uh, early 15th century, and Columbus vo voyages to the New World. So we can see that the European expansion coincides with the end of the Middle Ages. 
and oof, where are we are? Yes, and he speaks that the, the Middle Ages was a, a time in which Europe was very isolated from, from the rest of the world. And we, if you remember, we, we had Alexander that expanded, just went to uh, east and to the, the Himalayas. We, we had many, uh, the, the, the Roman Empire also expanded a lot, but it was kind of, during the Middle Ages, the world con uh, contracted and Europeans became uh, very isolated. And we also sometimes imagine there is something that is uh, the, the imaginary that uh, Greek culture, Hellenistic culture came as a straight line from Greece to, to West Europe. But no, it came through Islam. It came from, from Arab culture. So. This is something that, that sometimes we don't have in mind how isolated Europe was before the expansion. The Middle Ages represented an actual loss of contact with and knowledge of the outside world. In the Middle Ages, Europe closed in on itself. A key factor in this was that after the 7th century AD, sea routes and land routes alike were barred by the meteoric rise of Islam, which imposed its iron curtain between West and East. A second major obstacle to the East lay in the mind uh, consisting not only of the sketchy knowledge that Europeans had of the outside world, but of the way they conceptualized and imagined it. For what lay beyond, Europe relied on other sources of knowledge, classical, biblical, legendary, and mythological. And it's easy to see that when, when you see maps from that time that you have like mythical uh, creatures, we had like the body of Christ in the maps, and it wasn't an actual representation. It's still the map, maps are all, always distorted, but at that time it was much more fantasy than uh, uh, data. Something that is important because Europe was uh, surrounded by Islamic uh, uh, peoples. So when you have this idea of West and East at the time, East is not Japan, East is not China, East is Middle East. That, that was the, the idea at, at that point. Again, I... this. So he explains that there were five phases of European expansion. The first period was the, the exploration when Europe, Europe discovered the new worlds for the first time. And of course, the new worlds uh, already existed, they, they, they discovered. So second is the period of early contact, contact the conquest, the, the, the first settlements. So when they were still getting to know, the third phase was when they established the, the, the settlements, the, the exploitation, capital, capitalism emerged as a global market. So in this chapter, he focused on the first two, like contact, exploration, that's a conquest. So this is because this system of, of representation was formed back then, many centuries ago. The early Spanish explorers of the New World opened the way to that ruthless band of soldier adventurers, the conquistadores, who completed the conquest of Central and South America, effecting the transition from exploration to conquest and colonization. By the, By the 18th century? Please go ahead. Okay. 
By the 18th century, then, the main European world players, Portugal, Spain, England, France, and Holland, were all in place. The serious business bringing the far-flung civilizations they had discovered into the orbit of Western trade and commerce and exploiting their wealth, land, labor, and natural resources for European development had become a major enterprise. The wealth began to flow in 1554. America yielded 11% of the Spanish crown's income. In 1590, 50%. Can you imagine uh, like uh, European civilization, modernity without the, 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 those resources? It's impossible, <laughs> impossible. We turn next to the formation of the languages or discourses in which Europe began to describe and represent the difference between itself and these others it encountered in the course of its expansion. By discourse, by discourse, we mean a particular way of representing the West, the rest, and the relations between them. Discourse is about the production of knowledge through language, but it is self produced by a practice, discursive practice, the practice of producing meaning. Since all social practices entail meaning, all practices have a discursive aspect. I would argue that the discourse of the West about the rest was deeply implicated in practice, in how the West behaved towards the rest. He then explains the discursive strategies of representing the other. And this is a big part of the, the chapter, and I really recommend you to, to read, but uh, I'll try to summarize. There is the idealization. So imagine that the new world is like the, the, the paradise, the, 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 the nature, the exuberant na nature. And then there is, at the same time, a projection of fantasies, fantasies of uh, sexual fantasies, the desire for, 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 for the, the, the native. That is a, such an important part of uh, colonization. But also projection of fantasies of degradation, of violence, the um, cannibalism. Uh, there is also those fantasies. Three is the failure to recognize and respect difference. Because of course, uh, why, for, for them, what was different seemed all the same, all the same. The other were, was something that was completely uh, ind indistinct. It was completely different, dif uh, impossible to distinct the specificity of each society. And fourth, the tendency to impose European categories and norms, to see difference through the modes of perception and representation of the West. When it, we talk about epistemic decolonization, decolonization of knowledge is exactly about this, because everyone, doesn't matter, all the peoples on, on earth today, they have to represent themselves through the categories, through the norms, through the epistemology of the North, of the global North, the, the, the West. So they cannot really represent themselves in their own terms. That's something that, that started a long time ago. These strategies were all underpinning, underpinned by the process known as stereotyping. A stereotype is a one-sided description which results from the collapsing of complex differences into a simple cardboard cutout. The world is first divided symbolically into good, bad, us, them, attractive, disgusting, civilized, uncivilized, the West and the rest. By this strategy, the rest becomes defined as everything that the West is not. It's mirror image. It's represented as absolutely, essentially different other, the other. 
This other is then itself split into two camps, friendly, hostile, Arawak, Carib, innocent, depraved, noble, and ignoble. The noble, ignoble, and the rude, refined oppositions belong to the same discursive formation. This West and the rest discourse greatly influenced Enlightenment thinking. It provide the framework of images in which Enlightenment social philosophy matured. Enlightenment. Enlightenment thinkers believed that there was one path to civilization and social development, and that all societies could be ranked or placed early or late, lower or higher on the same scale. The emerging science of society was the study of the forces which had propelled all societies by stages along this single path of development, leaving some, regrettably, at its lowest stage. In Enlightenment discourse, the West was the model, the prototype, and the measure of social progress. It was Western progress, civilization, rationality, and development that were celebrated. And yet, all this depended on the discursive figure of the noble versus ignoble savage and the rude and refined nation, which have been formulated in the discourse of the West and the rest. So the rest was critical for the formation of Western enlightenment and therefore for modern social science. Without the rest or its own internal others, the West would not have been able to recognize and represent itself as a summit of human history. In response to this argument, you may find yourself saying, yes, perhaps the early stages of the science of man were influenced by the discourse of the West and the rest, but all that was long time ago. Since then, social science has become more empirical, more scientific. Sociology today is surely free of such loaded images. But this is not necessary. Go ahead. Okay, but this is not necessarily the case. Discourses don't stop abruptly. They go on unfolding, changing shape as they make sense of new circumstances. They often carry many of the same unconscious premises and unexamined assumptions in their bloodstream. And then I ask you, how does this course of the West and the rest play out today? How does it influence our practice? So I open the floor for discussion. Maybe I can start. I've been thinking a lot about it, and especially, um, you know, when people, we have a lot of discussions about science, Western science, especially now about vaccines and etc. But I, I see that a lot of the discourse, not, I'm not talking about vaccine anymore, but um, I see a lot of people talking about science and, and, and then they start basing everything about their lives on science itself and not acknowledging other types of science, just Western science. And I just think this is a very complex issue that we're always discussing, but uh, it's so difficult to speak about it and not being labeled as something, uh, you know, still nowadays. And people don't associate science with colonization often. More ideas. There. <laughs> just a quick observation. Um, uh, just trying about the idea of this being a dialogic process. I thought that was really interesting. I hadn't actually picked that up in Stuart Hall's writing before. It kind of makes sense now that filtered through in a lot of other OU traditions. But I wonder whether there's something really quite important about that dialogic thing because it allows us to imagine our personal practice in terms of dialogue and apply that at this kind of bigger scale, dialogues of centrist position to others or between eras or epochs. So I'm wondering whether or not there's something, not that he missed, but maybe there's something that needs articulated round about the asymmetry of dialogue. Because Stuart talked there about the fact that we use this to validate our own myths, our own theories. So we are talking, talking, and we are listening to the reflection of what we think we're hearing. We're not listening. 
and so many of the other dialogic practices I've come across in alternative studios and on country methods, um, for example, it's so much more important to do the listening bit than to do the other stuff. Um, I wonder whether there's a personal thing that might be, I don't know, reflected at the bigger scale. It was just something that occurred to me. But it's just uh, this dialogue that sometimes we think about, let's hear the other. It's here like very like limited so just the things that validate your your yep. d discourse mm -hmm. so Gwendolyn what do you have yeah I was just thinking about um, something that I also research on which is design in the context of development and grassroots empowerment and so on also in the context with international organizations and uh, I've seen it a lot of times that certain standards are applied to grassroots um, environments where they just don't fit. I mean, there's a big incongruence um, between them. The standards that, for example, an NGO or a, like an international organization that sponsors a project has the expectations and it cannot be implemented. So I see like very big gaps there. And it is very hard uh, for those people who implement these projects who maybe know any better um, what would be appropriate in this environment, in this context, um, to convince, uh, they, they have to make a big, a big stretch between satisfying somebody who sponsors the project and actually what they think is the appropriate thing to do. And so my own research is um, also um, in this context. And I think that is one of the biggest problems because development is still considered in these stages, largely, I think. Yes, because the, the discourse hasn't changed. The terms of the discourse changed. You don't, you don't say the West and the rest, but you have the developing and developed. You have a global north and, and in its case, and you have a lot, you, you have like United Nations, a lot of the discourse is not to let people, people behind. You have to, to carry people along. And it has a lot of this discourse in the sustainable development goals, etc. <laughs> Who's next, uh, Fred? Fred? Yeah. So I'm thinking about how this uh, concept of design and is somehow built on top of what's not designed, as in the same way as the West is built on the rest and a differences uh important for us but they are always enmeshed in discourses that seeks power <laughs> and defining what is the west and defining what is the design benefits some people while it does not benefit the other ones especially those that are uh, working for power in terms of being uh affected by that power and not having the opportunities to be recognized in their own terms <laughs> and speaking to what they really mean, what they really want, what they really are. And I think that, uh, it's, I don't think that we should give up the idea of the West or the idea of the design, but we should make, take care, uh, be cautious about uh, establishing differences and saying, this is design and this is not design. Because if you say this is not design, there's a lot of stuff that not really not design, but that might be more interesting <laughs> and show up new, uh, ways of uh, living in society that we just can't hear because we separate things together and and, and that's that's at the heart of this uh, conundrum <laughs> separating for isolating and while it's isolated you can hold the power over it because you don't you ignore it. there's difference there you just homogenize the rest you just homogenize everything that's not designed and it's outside of the scope in terms of discipline in terms of academic knowledge but in terms of politics, they are not worthy to stay living. <laughs> their, their lives uh, are more, less important than our lives. It is all enmeshed because academics yeah, are also a space of power. No, I, I think it's all enmeshed. And, and that's something that I always thought about what's the difference between design and craft and, and art. But basically, people who belong to the, the West, it doesn't matter where you are, you are a designer, you are an artist. If you belong to the rest, it's craft. And uh, you don't just, or it's something that the same practice of uh, world creating can, can be found in many places, but it, they are not recognized because they belong to the rest. 
Uh, who's, who's next? No, Amy. No, me? Hi, I thought it was actually Mariana, but it's okay. I can, I can go. Um, I wondered what, where in a way for me, the fact that it's kind of Stuart, Stuart Hall talks about it as a dialogue. It's, it's almost on one hand for me, he, he sort of identifies that there's an issue and that we, we need to be aware of it. And then we need to start kind of engaging with it. And maybe that's quite simplistic reading, but just to, to, to kind of go with that a little bit. For me, it also means that there's an opportunity to see some of these categories, which are not gone, like he argues as well, that you know they keep unfolding. It just, they, they might be uh, presented slightly differently, but the categories are not gone. They're often quite very strongly embedded in, in, in our practice, in our theories, in our thinking, in, in, in how we teach, for example, which is where I'm coming from. Um, but the idea of the dialogue for me also signifies the opportunity for change because it suggests it's fluid. So through dialogue, there's this opportunity to start challenging and, and questioning and, and seeking change and seeking the sort of a, a, a more explicit opportunity to um, redefine and rename and, and, and that suggests fluidity and that means that those sort of very set norms and and definitions and kind of you know this idea of west and 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 the rest can actually change can be you know if we work at it can can um become you know can be obliterated where, where they're wrong um and the reason i kind of thought about it in relation to education is because there's such a, a significant project going on you know around and in, in a lot of universities, I probably would say around the world anyway, um, around kind of decolonization and decolonization, but specifically in relation to our talks here, decolonization. And, and a lot of it um, kind of still trades um, in sort of quite set things. So, so if it's not one, it's the other. If it's not this, then it's, it's going to be that. But actually sort of, what I take from his his argument is that it's it's the space in between that that conversation that dialogue that's where the power for understanding could be and and that fluidity then can come in and so we can learn from it and and enabling for example students in our classes to be in that space it's troublesome space but it's a good space to be in because because of the the definitions they're kind of then fuzzy they are not rigid and we we can redefine them and, and change them so that's kind of where it sort of landed with me. I don't know whether rightly or wrongly, because I'm also a learner in this in, in this group, but but I thought that's kind of where it resonated with me, this op opportunity to be in that sort of troublesome space, but fluid space that can change for me. Yeah, the, the challenge is to, to, to learn how to listen, because after so many centuries projecting fantasies <laughs> on the other, it's still di difficult to, to be able to, 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 to really listen. Mariana, do you have some? What, what, what do you have to share? Uh, uh, thank you for the presentation, Renata. I was just wondering about... Uh, all these opposite pairs that are presented, not only by Stuart Hall, but we saw also with the in the Sylvia on the Sylvia Winter's work, and uh, I see it as one of the main issues in my point of view. This is my interpretation: is the problem of creating a kind of role model for people to follow, and so in this influencing our power relations and defining who is going to be powerful according to these models that are actually invented by people. And uh, so this is uh, just this comment. And about what Naomi was saying about dialogic, I see a lot about uh, more about learning by sharing instead of someone, you know, top down teaching you something. If you, we could listen more, it's also uh, it was previously commented here, mentioned the importance of actively listening to others. And I think I find very difficult when we are in a kind of traditional design conversation, I mean traditional by the Western design, 
with people really grounded in Western design, when we have the conversations and we try to talk about how many ways of creating and knowing that we have been neglecting. And it is just, uh, it is still completely, uh, people cannot get it. I don't know if uh, it is that complicated, but design is a creative is a creative activity. So why are we neglecting that other peoples have different ways of creating knowing just uh, these points, I think. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, Val, do you would like to share something? <laughs> Yes, hello everyone. Um, I found particularly interesting a uh, passage towards the last part in which you say that the West define itself uh, towards the dichotomy of the rest. And I find it particularly interesting because also uh, this is a, a macro level kind of discourse, but in micro dimension is more or less the same. In the writings of Sayyad, it was um, uh, describing the, the experience of the migrants. So in that case, Algerian migrants in France and how the nation was defining its own values just because the migrant was different from the nation. So it, the essence of the nation was just by the difference of what would never be assimilated completely. And this is particularly resonating because even Stuart, as you, uh, Renata, underlined, said, Britain is my own, but I'm not feeling English. This is this, this, your, I suppose, your same experience is my experience as migrant. So in a way, uh, the coloniality should be also applied in, in, in the West, not just outside the boundaries, if the boundaries uh, exist in a sense. Yes, he, he, he really also, also mentioned the others inside of Europe because we are, uh, Europe all, always had uh, the others, the Jewish, Jewish people. It's just that he focused the, the chapter more about the, the others outside because it was something that was much more, more um, in the, the sense that, that it had an impact, a uh, very big impact in the identity of Europe itself. But we have to, to really always understand that uh, there is no homogeneous, it, it's, not, it's not that we have like a, the, 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 the West is one thing. No, it's many different things. It's very complex. So yes, we also have to, 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 to remember that and thank you for, for, for remembering us. So Shem, do you like to, 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 to share something? I mean, wow, just like the whole conversation, the reading has been really profound in ways to see the parallels. Um, like Mariana was talking about with Sylvia Ryder, some of the authors that I read um, as well. And I'm just like, wow. Um, I feel like I have to unlearn, you know, I'm like, I went through this whole, like, I moved here from Trinidad, get into New York City, go to like this design school that's like prestigious, and I'm like, oh my goodness, you know, and then I'm like, I, I, I it's like, I can't even celebrate that because I'd never felt seen or heard there, and then I look at authors from the rest and I'm just like, whoa, I actually feel like I'm not gaslighted through my whole like career. Um, so it's like that, it, it, it surfaces a lot for me. Um, and, you know, I feel like it permeates. It's like in everything. I'm about to become a dad and, you know, we're like, whoa, like we didn't know 35% of women got like C-sections because of like institutionalized like medicine and like it's oppression of women. So we're like, uh, you know, it's like, again, the same, like in, in another space, but, and for me in the design lens, like, you know, I'm like, okay, I'm going to make these companies make millions of dollars and like do their products in the design process and ladder, but it's still for a consumer. And it's still like, from that lens and I'm like how do I get my young cousins and like nephews and nieces to like be as passionate about this with me but it's so in, 
it's so institutionalized and scholarly that it's hard for them to actually like grasp it. So like I have to kind of shift in the real world in my practice to use kind of art like that isn't very preachy. I mean, I watch Netflix like endlessly and like, you know, could I use media and art in a different way, shifting from like the product work to, um, to like, you know, engage these, this dialogue. That's what came up for me. No, so welcome to to the to the to the, to the pluriverse to the pluriverse of design sig. That's what we discuss here, and yes, that's totally totally the experience of being a a, a migrant, uh, and you fit, but you don't 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 really fit, and you're kind of gaslighted. There is something in this book uh, that this chapter of uh, Stuart Hall when he describes all the, the sexual fantasies and that that people have like i'm a, i am a brazilian woman can you believe how many projections people have like like when i, I would meet people the first thing that would they would would uh, comment was something that was uh, sexual i remember that i went to a conference in in the banff center it was a group of uh, indigenous scholars. The first question they, they asked me was like in a public, in a, group, in a big group, was if I had pubic hair. <laughs> yes, just the, the kind of situation. And when I, when I read this chapter, but when he started to, 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 to talk about this, this project of this kind of fantasy, I felt seen. I feel, felt that someone like Stuart Hall understands how it works. So it's really, you're not gaslighted, you're not crazy to think that this, this situation is super offensive. And that's why I really like to, to read it because it, it's almost as if he sees many situations of gaslighting that we go through when we are um, a, a migrant. Uh, who wants to go next? <laughs> Um, I just had another thought on the dialogic aspect of it. Um, so when we talk about dialogue, we also talk about equal um, participants and dialogues. And I think for designers, it's also very interesting to see how to strengthen the weaker, like the, the weaker voices. In this case, maybe the, the rest or how, um, how, yeah, how to give a voice to the rest and also how to give an audience to the rest, because um, that is, that is often not the case, or it is maybe very diff um, difficult. It reminds me a lot of generally subalt uh, subaltern studies, Gayatri Spivak, and, and so on. The, can the subaltern speak these kind of um, books? And also Paulo Freya, of course, with the critical consciousness. Um, so I'm thinking when we talk about dialogue, we have to also think about how to include everybody in the dialogue. And I think designers can contribute here, maybe. And value hmm? everyone. And value everyone. Yes. Beyond yeah. yeah, that's brilliant. Morgan. Uh, um, a lot of uh, things that have come up today, especially about uh, listening and uh, waiting for a reflection and, and that sort of thing, have made me think about how we as designers. Um, often are the ones to speak first, uh, either in terms of uh, bringing people to the table of co-design or putting products out into the world. Uh, and so I wonder how the field of design would shift if we were the ones who uh, waited for the other person or the other beings to speak first um, and like what, what that power and that role would, how that would shift. I don't have answers for that, but that's just what that, all of this made me think of. Thank you. More thoughts? Uh, I would like just to mention that uh, Stuart Hall is also read in the South, but in a different way, because this proposal of multiculturalism is something that we find here in Latin America quite unfeasible. This idea of having a dialogue that is peaceful and having this coexistence under the framework of democracy sometimes uh, have led us to situations in which a lot of different groups were not considered to be a culture and then it could just be erased and took take out of the 
political spectrum. Therefore, uh, people like Paulo Freire, but also specifically others in multiculturalism, there is this uh, uh, Mexican um, researcher called uh, um, Nestor Garcia Canclini. He has written extensively on multiculturalism, challenging that notion that Stuart Hall and others that have uh, followed this concept and say that it's, it's basically impossible to uh, have this coexistence because uh, it's so different. And if you take, take, try to put them all into a, a, one framework, even if that's multicultural, multiculturalism, multicultural country or democracy, or even pluriverse, <laughs> to, to pick up one of these uh, current uh, concepts used to try to and unify, you would basically uh, ignore the conflict that is inherent. And that's also something that will not be solved by creating safe spaces or creating universal categories. We have to deal with those conflicts and perhaps multiculturalism is not the way to go. Other thoughts? I, I have a thought on what Fred just said. I, I think in academia and in you know, left-wing thinkers in Brazil, this is totally true, but I've been working with indigenous peoples and I feel like when it comes from their place, some of them can, can see that they are talking about like the pluriverse without even realizing what they're talking about. It's just, uh, they have this vision. So I just wanted to <laughs> say that. Yes, I totally agree with Janan that the, just the, m many of the, the, the visions that I had about the, the, the pluriverse is things that, that I learned with uh, uh, knowledge keepers from, from, from the Amazon, from how much they want to, 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 to be part of the, the, the conversation and to defend their, their way of representing the world. Other thoughts? I was just wondering one more thing is like sometimes even uh, like indigenous people contributing a lot uh, to preserving the forests and so on. And actually they are marginalized about that, especially in Brazil instead. So I think also that there are all any space of informality, even informal settlements that actually they are solutions for things that, you know, our power structures and formal structures didn't solve. And at the end of the day, they became marginalized. So I think there are an inversion of values as well that uh, when we think about yeah, the difference, social differences, economic differences. Yeah, going back to Renata's question, it's it's exactly what you said, Mariana. It's like we put them in a place of poverty because they don't have the same resources that we consider what's uh, being rich. So there, and, and this idea that if you're not productive, you're not a member of society that's valid. So they put them all of indigenous peoples in this category. There is this, this imaginary category that is about they are outside of society, they are outside of, of the system, but they are just, a, a, what is interesting about this West and the rest is that the, the, the outsiders are a super important part of, of the system, have always been since the beginning. So it's this, uh, this course of putting them outside that, that creates the, the situation. Uh, there is a Brazilian anthropologist, Viveiro de Castro, that said that colonization was a process of, of transforming indigenous people into poor. That's the, 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 that was the, the process. And I totally think that that's the case. You just see that what they supposedly lack, not what they are. So we have two minutes. Uh, do you know if you have one very quick comment or we can start to, to, to close this? I would like to ask you, Renata, do you feel like Brazilians or Latin America is part of, are part of the West? I don't think so. 
I think it's uh, some people in, in Brazil believe they want to be even more Western than than the, the than, than uh, North American than uh, European. But I really don't think uh, uh, that that the Brazilians are. <laughs> I don't think. I, I think many want to be, but we don't really are. <laughs> I don't know. I think it's complicated. You know, I kind of push back on um, there are words that I push back on, like everyone else. You know, I push back on the word American because, um, you know, all of us from the Americas kind of in theory have a right to use that kind of word. Or um, I, I do think. Yeah, I know that the West is this kind of fictitious, fictitious place, but I, I think that there are thought patterns that maybe do cross the hemisphere. So if you think about it linearly and, you know, and, and, and say, well, this is the line, I think that people on one side of the Atlantic probably do think differently too. So maybe all of this that I'm saying is just to say that, yes, it's complicated. Mm -hmm. And yes, Brazilians are probably part of the West, and how we define that West is just, um, it'll be different in different different situations, I suppose. Yes, of course, if you go to the Brazilian universities, they are part of the West. They, they, they are part of the, of the West. But I think, I still think that uh, the biggest part of Brazilian population is not part of the West. I think it well, depends the on West the is not what, Maybe the West is not what the West, in quotes, thinks it is. Maybe. You know, <laughs> but if you, think of the, if you think of the South American context, this Brazil is huge and it, ha it has a lot of influence over the other countries that are there. So if you think of that, then maybe it is the West. <laughs> yeah, maybe it is the West. Oh, yeah, I guess so. It's the West I, of I, the rest. It's the, it's the West yeah. of the, yes, the rest. West of the rest. Yeah, the rest of the rest. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here and discussing this chapter that I totally love and reading with me. And I hope that you buy and read because it's really nice. It's really cool. Mm -hmm.